No one can ever accuse Josh Ramsey of being a slacker. For almost two decades, he's been the lead singer of Vancouver pop rock band Mariana's Trench, while also collaborating with a wide range of other artists, most notably Carly Rae Jepsen, with whom he co-wrote her worldwide smash hit song, Call Me Maybe. With the pandemic putting the brakes on any plans Mariana's Trench had to follow up their 2019 album Phantoms, Ramsey threw himself into creating his first ever solo album, The Josh Ramsey Show. Josh wrote, produced and played all the instruments on it with the exception of the orchestral parts and he also had some very big guests including Nickelback's Chad Kroger. I spoke to Josh at his home in Vancouver about the record. And at the end of our chat, I even get a free cookery lesson thrown in. We've got this album, The Josh Ramsey Show, coming out. So if we get a ticket for The Josh Ramsey Show, what should we expect? Um, well, I'm going to do the whole record. Um, and, uh, I might throw in some song. I might throw in a few songs from, uh, uh, I was, I'm considering, I'm toying with the idea of putting in a few songs that I've written for other artists over the years, maybe. Oh yeah. Um, that might be fun. Um, and you know, the, the band is really fun. I've put together a band of multi-instrumentalists. So we're going to do some instrument trading on stage, which I'm looking forward to. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So what do you get from making your own solo stuff that you don't get from Mariana Strange? Um, that's a great question. I think um, I think the difference, there's a certain satisfaction you get if you just make something on your own. And I always wanted to do an album where I played all the instruments myself. And I think I never got around to it because I'm so busy with Mariana's Trench and writing and producing for other artists as well. Um, and then the pandemic happened and the world just shut down. And I was like, I can finally get around to doing this idea. So there's a there's a real satisfaction in that for me because it's sort of been a lifelong goal for me to do. So I definitely have like crossed it off the bucket list. Amazing. And this album, although there's some subjects that are a bit heavy on the album, the whole flavor of the album is very uplifting. Yeah. Which, which I guess is something that we all need at the moment. Was that a deliberate thing because of the times we're living in? Yes. Yes, it was. Um, I think uh, no one wants a fucking sad sack album right now, man. <laughs> the world doesn't need that. Um, you know, uh, I, I think I look at the success of shows like Ted Lasso and I'm like, this is what people need right now. Um, oh, yeah. We definitely need Ted Lasso. That's for sure. You know, um, and not that this feels like Ted Lasso, but um, <laughs> even even in even in tackling some serious subjects, like I did lose both my parents during this time. Um, I still wanted to tackle that not with loss, but with with love and sort of paying homage to them uh, rather than rather than uh, like de depressing and, and sad and stuff. Um, and, you know, I just I, I really hope that people listen to this album and uh, get positive vibes. Yeah, well, I definitely think there's a lot of positive vibes. There's also a, a very crisscross of genres on this album. Yeah. Yeah. So was that something deliberate? You wanted to just try all kinds of things on this one that you couldn't do before with the band? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think, um, uh, it, well, it wouldn't have made sense for me to just make a Mariana's Trench album on my own. Like, why would I do that? Um, fans wouldn't appreciate that. I'm sure my bandmates wouldn't appreciate that either. <laughs> so then I was sort of like, okay, well, I am the songwriter for Mariana's Trench. So if I'm going to do something solo, what does that look like? Um, okay. Well, I guess I'll just, I'll just try and do as many genres as I can. That sounds fun. And it, it sort of started out as a writing exercise and then just sort of snowballed from there. Yeah. And you've got 18 songs on this album. Yeah. And as we've discussed, there's all kinds of genres. How do you go about putting things together in an order that makes sense for you? Yeah, um, that was uh, that. Uh, that's a smart question because that was actually really, really difficult to get the album to flow and not just feel like a scatter shot of 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 music, you know, um, yeah. and to get it to get it to tie together. Um, I think um, I it was putting it together was like a jigsaw puzzle. I had a session, a, an assembly session where I kept moving songs around and seeing what flowed the best. And it took a long time to get it right. Um, and then once I did, then the the three pieces of music that sound sort of more like film score elements, I, I feel like those sort of um, act as act breaks on the album and sort of serve to tie the whole thing together because then the the last song on the album is a full symphony that I wrote for my dad. And I feel like since we've heard little snippets of symphonic elements throughout the album, when it gets to that last song, it makes sense. You mentioned the film score element of what you've done here. And mm. I know a few years ago, somebody asked you that question, would you want to do a film score? And you said, well, I've never had enough time until, until I get like six months or a year with nothing to do. 
Right. That's what I might do a film score. Obviously, a couple of years after that, you were given plenty of time to do something a bit different. And this is the album that's come from that. Is film score something that you would like to do in future? 100%. Yep, definitely. Um, I definitely want to do that. Um, I'm just waiting for the right opportunity to do that. And actually in... Um, in prepping for, I just feel, I just know eventually that's going to happen and I'm going to do that. So what I've actually been doing to practice is I grab scenes from movies off of YouTube and take off all the sound and then write a new score for it. Right. Any particular ones? Yeah. I've posted them on my social media stuff. Um, I did a James Bond scene. Um, uh, the, and the first, the first one I did was actually cause, um, all press in the United States had met, they, they released a list of artists that they would like to see work in Marvel movies. And I was one of the people on the list. Um, and everyone got very excited about that. Not that that means anything. This is totally a <laughs> hypothetical list, obviously, but, um, um, so that was my first idea as I was like, okay, I'll do a Marvel movie. Um, so the first one I did for practice was a scene from Dr. Strange. You've mentioned that sometimes when you're going on stage with the band, that you kind of take on this persona of the front man of a band. Definitely. When you're doing solo stuff, does that change? Yeah, I think it is. It's still going to be a persona, um, but I think uh, I, I think it's going to be a bit different. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it's been a bit different album to album, even within Mariana's Trench. Um, uh, like the... Certainly when we did the Astoria album, that version was 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 really based around the 80s rock stars from the Sunset Strip. So it was like, I knew I was going to take my shirt off, for example, because so, those guys always did. So, you know, I got in, I worked, worked out really, really hard for that album mm-hmm. and uh, really ate right and all of that stuff. And uh, and I think that persona was a lot cockier because I was trying to I was trying to do the sort of the, those 80s L.A. guys. So um, that that version of him was 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 a lot cockier, whereas um, on Phantoms, that guy had was very haunted and, and almost sort of broken. So I think there was a lot more vulnerability to the character on that one. This one, because because the because the genres move around so much, I'm not I haven't totally arrived yet. I'm still sort of making some choices at, at what that's going to look like. Um, but yeah, it'll be a bit different. I feel like if if at some point somebody wanted to cast a rock star in a movie, that you could just jump into whichever role they gave you. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so when when did your musical journey start as a kid? Like, what was the what was the music that turned you on to music the most? Oh, you know what? Um, I mean, when I was a kid, um, my father, um, my father started with two of his friends, started a very iconic Vancouver studio called Little Mountain Sound. And that was around before I was born. So when I, I and then my mom was a vocal coach. Um, so it was like when I was a kid, if I went to work with my dad, um, it was like, you know, Aerosmith was recording or Metallica was recording or Bon Jovi or Brian Adams, all these people were always there. And then most of the time, those singers were coming to our house and taking lessons from my mom. So I was really exposed to it before I could even speak. I, that's what I was doing. Um, so it, it, I, I wouldn't say it was like a specific uh, a specific band or artist that turned me on to music. It was just like, I was overexposed to it. I, I thought I thought every adult was a musician until I was like about seven. You know, I, I thought that's just what you do when you grow up. So when you get to your teenage years, most teenagers kind of rebel against what their mom and dad are doing. But when your mom and dad are working in that world, is that hard to rebel against? I didn't rebel. I didn't. I embraced. <laughs> yeah, I totally embraced. <laughs> so what records remind you of your teenage years the most? Uh, my teen, early teens. Um, well, one of my favorite albums, which was shown to me by my parents and the band had already broken up by the time I discovered them, but um, the band Jellyfish from San Francisco was a huge yeah, nice. band for me because- I actually saw them live. Oh, fuck you, you <laughs> yeah. did? That's amazing. Uh, yeah, one of the singers, uh, one of the singer, singers on that, um, uh, Roger uh, sang on on one uh, on on a couple of Mariana's Trench songs as well, actually, which I was over the moon when he did. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Jellyfish Spilt Milk was a really huge album for me. Um, the other ones in my early teens, when I was like you know thirteen, kind of thing. Um, I think the Foo Fighters' Color and the Shape was a big album for me as a kid, uh, and I think also Benfold's Five, Whatever and Ever, Amen. I thought was uh, was a really that was a really because it was a new thought when I heard. I think I was about twelve when I heard that record and. It was, I had never heard, a, uh, it was like, okay, so you guys are a rock band with no guitar. Uh, holy fuck, this is amazing. This is so, and this, the writing is so incredible and the playing is incredible. Um, and yeah, I think I was about 12 when that came out and that was that was a big deal for me in that one. Have you ever heard Ben Folds cover of the Snoop Dogg song? 
No, but I've heard him do silly things like that. I haven't heard that specific one, but I've heard him do silly things. Like uh, that. Yeah, you should go and check it out. It's so funny. Yeah, um, he's hilarious. So you've got you've got a couple of big name collaborators on on this record. It, do you pay attention to new music as well? Uh, yeah, of course. I, I I'm a little bit out of. Uh, a little bit out of shape on my current knowledge because I've been buried and working on this. Right. Um, but I'm ready to dive into some new playlists and stuff now that uh, now that I can put this record uh, to bed. So talking about collaborators then, uh, did you have like dream names that you wanted to try and get on the record or you just had songs that you thought would fit certain people? Um, for the most part, I wrote the songs for the specific people. So I had, I had most of the people in mind already. Um, there were only two people... Um, there were only two people that I wrote songs for that said no, and they didn't say no because they didn't want to do it, but they said no because they were just unavailable and they were too busy, which makes sense because that was Brian Adams and Sting. So that's fair. <laughs> that's fair. Yeah, you're um, aiming high there. Yeah, yeah. So, um, um, and actually, ironically, Brian, I, I mixed the album in Brian's studio and he was working upstairs while I was working downstairs. Um, anyway. Wow. But they were they were both just unavailable because they both had like three albums coming out this year or something crazy like that, which makes sense. But, you know, it was still I wasn't bummed about it because um, because I was writing for both of those specific guys. I was writing from a very specific point of view and I wouldn't have written those songs otherwise. And I still got the songs out of it. And that's the most important part. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we know that you've written songs for other artists in in multiple genres, some some of which are very different from the music that you make. Yeah. How do you feel making those songs in those genres and for those artists benefits you as a songwriter yourself? Yeah, that's a that's a very astute question. Um, it, it definitely benefits you because you have to do research in the genre. And then you there's always production tricks and sort of songwriting formulas that you'll see in various genres. And that's always a learning environment for me. So that's a that's always a great opportunity to be learning new things, which I can then take back and apply to whatever project I want. Um, the only time where it gets a little bit frustrating, if I'm being totally candid, is sometimes when you write for a big pop act, you're not writing for an artist anymore. It feels more like you're writing for a committee because you, you, you'll get like, so an example, and this song never got used. Um, oh my God, what was the band that Harry Styles was in? One Direction, thank One you. Direction. God, idiot. Um, so I got asked to write a song for them when they were um, at their peak and um, their management sent me literally a checklist of like, you have to talk about this, you have to talk about this, you have to talk about this, the instrumentation must be this, it must be this, we cannot do this. Keep in mind, it sounds like a rock band, but these are pop songs, strictly pop songs, no rock, no adult, like, it was like for real, like a laundry list of, of things to hit and it just didn't it felt very uninspiring because you're like okay i'm just i'm 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 just this is this feels like paint by numbers um and maybe that's why they didn't use the song because maybe it wasn't that good i don't know <laughs> it feels like if you had like an ai music making machine you could just yeah all, these, all this information and yeah it it's like a something back at you like a fucking pop algorithm or something yeah <laughs> so from Mariana's Trench to your new solo album and we've got 18 songs on this solo album so there's a lot of songs and then all the other songs that you've done with other artists can you give me like two or three songs that you're you feel really proud of oh god um <laughs> I don't know man I I'm, I'll say this in honesty once I'm done with a song then I I kind of put it away um but I will say that every single song I've written at the time that I was working on it was the, my favorite thing that I'd ever done. I, I'm always, you know, I, you have to really love what you're doing in the moment. And, um, and that's the, for me, that's the, the most inspiring place to be. So um, yeah, I'll say that like every single song that I have put out at, at some point when I was working on it, that was my favorite thing I'd ever done. You've had a lot of success, like you've been really successful in multiple ways. I've been very lucky. For, for the Josh Ramsey show, what would success look like for that? Um, I just, I, I hope people like it. I, I hope people um, feel positive when they listen to it. Um, I wasn't sure at first if, if people were going to embrace it or freak out. Um, and I feel so far, I feel very grateful. It feels like uh, people are embracing it. I, I think the first two songs that I put out, were, people were like, what? Um, and, and honestly, the whole album's kind of, what? Um, because it, it doesn't sound like what I normally do. Um, but um, I just, I hope people, I hope people enjoy it. That would be a success for me. Yeah. And you got, you're taking these songs on the road. 
do you think the songs will sh- will change in a live environment? Oh yeah, there, there's always there's always you know there's other musicians and stuff, and I want to leave room for everyone to be able to improvise and add their own thing to their their part. And we're not going to play it exactly like the album. We're gonna you know we'll we'll change some stuff around. And one of the major things is obviously I don't have all these featured artists uh, touring with me, so <laughs> I. I yeah, I uh, I made sure I made sure to, to put together a band with um, other people who can cover lead vocals so that uh, we can fill in for people. Um, and then I'm hoping I'm hoping to to in, to have surprise guests as well from some of the people on the albums and various shows or other or other reputable artists that feel like coming and sitting in. I want it to be very collaborative. And then what's next after that? What have you got planned for the rest of the year? Um, then there's there's more touring this album that just hasn't been announced yet, but it will be. Um, they're looking at uh, U.S. dates. They're looking at European dates. So there's that. And then I'm also juggling at the same time working on the new Marianas album and also doing some festival dates with Marianas. So uh, never a dull moment. <laughs> I was going to say, you never get a day off really, do you? No, no. <laughs> so my last question, I know you have a cooking channel. Yeah. What would you recommend I make for dinner tonight? Uh, well, what are your preferences? What are your tastes? I like all kinds of things, but maybe something Italian-y. Okay. Um, if you're looking for something Italian uh, and something quick that you don't need to have a whole bunch of skill set for, I think pasta puttanesca is a great starting point um, because you can cook it in the same time. You can cook the sauce at the same time that it takes to cook the pasta. So as soon as the wa- water's boiling, put in your pasta, salt the water, and then you need about a tablespoon of crushed garlic, a tablespoon of anchovy paste. Uh, fry that off first uh, for about a minute and then put in uh, one large can of uh, tomatoes, break it up with your hands, uh, and then cook that out for a bit and then you want to add about um, one small tin of uh, black olives and uh, about a tablespoon of capers Uh, and then at the end uh, take the pasta out when it's a little bit early and finish cooking it in the sauce and then add a soft herb of choice at the end uh, usually basil parsley dill and then uh, some chili flakes for some heat amazing like that sounds delicious what you just said yeah try it not sure it would be quite as delicious when i make it but i'll give it a go yeah, all right. <laughs> all right. Thanks very much. It's been really nice talking to you and good luck with everything you've got coming up. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate right. it. 